during my uh, telomere phase, as you'll recall, um, there was a uh, a discovery that gave me particular joy associated with the fact that dermatologists were talking themselves silly about the following observation. The expectation was that exposure to UV causes cancer. Every, everybody who was dermatologically aware knew that. But it was becoming clear that people that have very sun-damaged skin, farm workers, cowboys, people who work under the hot sun enough that their skin is visibly sun damaged have very low rates of cancer, mm -hmm. right? And so uh, it happens that my telomere work see, gives us exactly the reason for this, and it tells you where to draw the line. So first of all, sun damaged skin is damaged, right? Um, it loses its elasticity. It doesn't do the jobs that skin does, that healthy young skin does as well as, uh, it doesn't do it as well as healthy young skin. But if you are exposed to the sun continuously and it is damaging tissue such that you are basically turning over your cells at a high rate, but you are not getting so much intensity that it is causing genetic damage, which causes, which is mutations, which cause tumors, mm -hmm. then what you are doing is effectively aging your skin artificially quickly. But if you're aging it without mutating it, then the point is that is expending your lifetime capacity for repair. And your lifetime capacity for repair is what gives you the danger of tumors because the capacity of one cell to reproduce itself many times after it's had a mutation gives you a big patch of cells that can get a second mutation that will turn it into a tumor. But people whose skin is artificially old because they've spent a lot of time in the hot sun without getting sunburns, they are, uh, they, when they get a mutation, it creates a much smaller patch of cells. And so they are actually protected by the damage. So, so once your skin is no longer capable of repair, you won't ever have youthful looking skin again, but you are also very unlikely to get cancer in that skin. If you didn't get uh, sunburns along the way. That's, that's, that's the, the key yes. thing. Mm -hmm. And so this also explains the other interesting phenomenon, which was long known, which was that sunburns are the thing that leads to cancer, but it's early sunburns that lead to cancer later in your life. So mm -hmm. the early sunburns, you get a mutation in a cell from UV light, that cell then starts reproducing uh, in an unre unregulated way, it becomes a patch of cells, which is a mole, basically, and then it stops at its telomeric limit. Well, the bigger the patch of cells is when it reaches that limit, the greater the chance that one of those cells will get a second mutation that frees it from the limit and turns it into a tumor. So anyway, the, the bottom line here at some level is uh, biology is always a complex system and the answers aren't necessarily what you expect. And, you know, turns out sunscreen, which we were told that we, you know, shouldn't dare go outside without it uh, during the summer, it has many negative effects that going out in the sun has many positive effects, that those effects are not necessarily ones you'd predict, like the vitamin D protective effect against COVID. Mm -hmm. So let's um, let's actually just talk a little bit more about um, what, what we have done and what we did with our, with our kids early on when all of the advice and every time we'd send them to school or camp or something, we were told, you know, you have to pack a tube of sunscreen or probably come back empty and all of this. And we, we didn't do this. Um, so I, I'd, I'd like to share just a little bit about, you know, how and how and why, um, but also say that, um, you know, the, your, your point that s early sunburn predicts later cancer uh, does raise the issue of, okay, what is the boundary between a burn and a tan? And, you know, tan is this protective response by the skin, but of course, almost everyone has had the experience of, you know, spending a little bit too much time outside, thinking you got away with it, thinking it went to tan, and then finding that it was actually a burn underneath. And so this, like, basically boundaries between categories in every complex system that you can name is fuzzy, right? And so, you know, you, you want to avoid getting too near that, that border between tan and burn as well. Well, I agree. Uh, the problem is it's fuzzy in the moment. In other words, hmm. you will have a burn before you have any ah, yes. evidence that you have a burn. On the other the, hand, the I experience would say, is analog, but the actual like, did it mutate or did it not is digital. Well, it's not even did it mutate because you may not end up with a mutation. Mm -hmm. Did you damage tissue such that it requires replacement so that you end up with the sloughing of skin that comes with the burn? Uh, the alternative being your skin anticipates damage based on detecting a lot of sunlight and it darkens, if you're light skinned, it darkens the color of your skin in order to protect the cells that are there. And so the tan, the sweet spot, 
is where you got enough sun to trigger this, but you didn't get so much sun that you damaged tissue. And then genetic damage is one layer beyond that. Um, mm -hmm. And that's the thing that uh, you have to worry about. Now, here's an interesting phenomenon. So I used to burn very, very easily. And I did get some of those sunburns uh, in youth that tend to predispose a person to skin cancer. Um, but I've also learned just by observing my own interaction with the world how to manage it without sunscreen, right? Um, so that hat on my Twitter profile is part of my strategy when I'm in the field, especially in the tropics, is that hat's great. It's also great for rain. Um, keeps the uh, rain off of off of your face, which is really very useful. But and it's a great conversation starter. Uh, it's a terrible conversation <laughs> starter. People assume it's some sort of a prop. Right. But, um, but anyway, the the thing that I learned about myself, which I've now taught my kids, and when they think of it, it works for them too, is that you can get a lot of sun exposure where you're headed towards a burn, and then you can take a short break like a five minute break in the shade, or if you, there's no shade, you can turn. So a different side of you is facing the sun and it seems to reset some sort of counter. And the thing that I think is interesting is it suggests an, a process that is analogous to what we now know about COVID infection. Mm -hmm. So COVID infection, at least as our current model looks, there's like a bucket and that bucket, as long as it doesn't reach the top, means that even if you encountered some COVID, you're very unlikely to get sick. It's only when the bucket overflows because you've had exposure over some period of time and the bucket filled up that you're likely to get it, which means if you're outside, which is constantly emptying the bucket, you're very low risk. So the viral particles fly away from you. Right. And mm -hmm. so there's something, and uh, I'd be hard pressed to tell you what it is. I don't know. But there's something about the, the exposure mechanism with respect to yeah. the, the mm -hmm. sun damage. There's something about the skin that is able to tolerate a certain amount of sun intensity. And if you just keep building it up, you it's like it's like a bucket that has a hose in it. Mm -hmm. that's bigger, you know, that's putting in more water than the leak in the other side of the bucket. The bucket eventually overflows. But if you allow it to drain, and draining in the case of the sun exposure is just a matter of giving it some time in which you're not bombarding it with new sunlight, mm -hmm. seems to reset something. And yeah. so the thing that's surprising to me is that it's not, it's not like you half can't an just, hour in the sun, right. you need a half an hour in the shade. It's half an hour in the sun, you need two or three minutes yeah. in the shade. Nor, nor can you just count up the number of minutes you want to spend in the sun and say, okay, I'm just going to take that all at once. You know, say right. say you have skin that can tolerate three hours, um, that, that you have calculated can tolerate three hours in the sun at a time. Well, that's, that's youthful and extraordinarily sun resilient skin. Um, but actually, say you did it for three hours, you could probably take a break and at three hours, you need maybe 15, 20 minutes and go back out again. Yeah. Uh, now this this really does seem to be the experience. I have I have less direct empirical experience just because I don't I don't tend to burn. But yeah. we've seen it with you and both of our children as well. Yeah. yeah. The other the last thing I would say, and first of all, this is just my experience. Uh, you know, I'm, it's not uh, it's anecdote at best. Um, so uh, your mileage is almost certainly going to vary, and you have to figure out your own pattern. Um, but I sometimes find that when I blow it a little bit and I go too far, mm -hmm. and I know this because when I come in finally, you know, my skin is hot mm -hmm. and it's like, is that a burn? You can go a certain amount too far and then it doesn't end up being a burn. So there's some sort of, uh, you have exceeded tolerances, but not so much that it's gone critical phase, which allows you to actually know where you are in um, finding that border. But it requires that you pay attention to the feedback your body is giving you. Yeah. Right? It requires that you have a sense of what your skin and your breathing and everything else about your physiology normally feels like so that as it begins to send you warning signals, <clears throat> excuse me, you are in a position to read them and to receive them. Yeah, absolutely. And a lot of things work this way, medically speaking. We're paying attention mm -hmm. to the patterns. Even if you don't know what the underlying mechanism is, right. you can uh, manage things. 